In the last video we opened the SMSL D6S DAC and looked at the features, measurements and briefly how it's made. In this video we're gonna take a deeper dive into the PCB and the components used. Here I have a photo of the PCB. I will just go through the components here so it's, it's clearer to see what I'm showing. Here's the power supply, mains power supply, which has this air gap here and a transformer to isolate it from, from the rest. And there is also a plastic sheet on the bottom side of the PCB. So we have some filtering components here. And this is a common mode choke here, a rectifier. And then we re rectify the, the full mains voltage with some high voltage capacitors here. And then there's a DC-DC that goes through this transformer, which is then drops the voltage and also acts as an isolation and then we have the main rectifier here with discrete diodes that creates around plus minus 12 and a half volts and these are the electrolytics for that and under this uh, ribbon cable here is a dc dc converter which i presume generates a 4.2 volt supply which is at this gap here which we see and then the 4.2 volts i presume is taking these few ldo's here to generate some extra supplies that are marked on the PCB here. And here we have some FETs or LDOs that create around plus minus 11 volts from the 12 and a half volt. So that's then the supply used for the op pumps for the DAC output stage. If you look at some of the power supply components, so here these LDOs, I was not able to identify these by the markings, but this is a typical package for an LDO. And then we have some uh, decoupling capacitors and ferrite beads here. So this most like these are LDOs, especially when the voltages are marked here. This one here was a FET. So this may be used as a switch for the supplies. It's good to remember this, um, this is always on, the mains is always on. So power on off is, is a soft power switch. So they may be using some switches here to turn off some of the power rails. And these ones here are either LDOs or FETs. I, I suspect they're probably LDOs because he, here they drop the voltage from 12.5 to 11 volts, but these are sanded. When we look at the, some of the ICs here, like for example, this one, I, I can see the markings on a different photo. It's just the, the light is, is bad in this one. A few of these here, like these three ICs, these were, I suppose, LDOs. These are filed or sanded, so you cannot see the markings. And this is something that you've always seen in especially like Chinese made devices. So if you're doing this, you're hiding something. You either don't want people to see what components you've used because you want to, to protect your circuit or you're hiding it because maybe it's not a genuine component or something like that. So I don't know. I don't know what they're doing this. And if you go to the inputs, so here we have what looks like a Bluetooth module with the antenna connector here. So here we have Qualcomm QCC6125. I couldn't find exact match for the Qualcomm chip, but these similar model numbering are used for their headphones, headset, earbud, Bluetooth chips, which kind of makes sense. So it is some sort of a Bluetooth slash DSP SOC. And the wind bond chip here next to it, that is a, a flash to go with uh, the Qualcomm chip. If you look at this Exmos chip here, the closest match to this one is an Exmos XU316, which again, it's a microcontroller, multi-core microcontroller. Exmos chips are used for audio USB input, so that takes care of the, the USB audio. And this one here again is a serial flash, so that goes with the Exmos. And then if we go to this one here, this photo doesn't show it really well, but we can we can see the, the model number in different photos. And that one is an STC microcontroller, and this is an 8051 single core microcontroller. I'm not sure what this one is doing. It, it may be just doing some sp specific one task. And now if we look at this one here, things are quite interesting. We see the markings, there's coaxial optical Bluetooth coming in here. And this is the one that has signals going to the dock. So this needs to be some kind of input selector where the various inputs come in and the I2S goes out to the dock. Just a wild guess. 
what it could be. I had a look at this TI PCM 9211 I've used in the past and the several pins I check here where the, the SPDF inputs come in, where the ITUS goes out, where the oscillator is in, it matches exactly this chip. It could be something like that because this one has um, SPDF receiver and it has quite extensive I2S routing options, like you have several serial ports, so you could do like this, that you take in the SPDF inputs and the I2S from the Bluetooth and the I2S from the, the USB and do all the, the switching here and just select which one goes out to the dock. But there's what I don't understand is that because this one is limited to 216 kilohertz, but this DAC supports higher sample rates from the USB. So if the USB is routed via this one, it, it needs to be something else. And then again, they have other TI chips here, which they haven't sanded. So why have they sanded this one? Maybe it's something else that works like this TI chip, but it has a higher specs or I don't know. I'm just guessing. If you go back to the USB, which is under this Toslink connector here, this one here is a USB switch. So this is a Chinese part, but it looks like it's similar to, uh, for example, this TI part, one to two multiplexer, demultiplexer, USB. And this one here next to it is a, a USB to serial port. How it looks like here, the USB comes in to the switch, which then selects whether it goes to the Xmox for the US, Xmos for the USB audio, or this USB to serial chip, which kind of looks like goes to this uh, STC microcontroller. So this could be, for example, the switch selects whether we're using USB audio or USB for firmware update, for example. If we look at the oscillators, we can see there's at least four oscillators here visible. So here is one that looks like 32 megahertz. That's probably for the Bluetooth because it's on, on this module. And then we have 24 megahertz here, which is um, kind of USB um, clock rate 12 or 24 quite often. Here we have 27 going to this. I don't know. I still don't know what are these chips. And here we have a typical audio frequency oscillator 24.576 going to this SPDF receiver. And then let's go to the DAC. Let's first see the components used here. So the DAC chip is the ES9039Q2M. This one here is an LDO DILP2985. And then these, all these four, that's a OPA1612 op-amp. It has different markings for this package. This one here, it looks like it's a buffer for the LDO for reference generator. And then we have three op-amp output stage here. And then all the outputs go through these chips, what I've seen also in the Wim Ultra Fossi audio and apparently Topping used them as well. It looks like it, it's this one. It's an analog switch and it's used um, as a mute switch. Let's have a look at the DAC and the output stage. The ESS DAC datasheet is publicly available, unlike they were some years ago, and it's also a lot more comprehensive and better quality than they used to be, although it's still not as great as um, Texas Instruments datasheets, for example. In the previous video, we looked at the, the filter options available on the, the DAC menu. So here you can see, for example, here are the eight filters that we can select, and there's some um, delays and um, just the characteristics and some plots of this filter. So these may be of interest if you want to change the filters yourself. Something we're interested in here is the recommended output state. So this is what they show in the datasheet. It's a bit odd how this is drawn, but it's basically this one is a difference amplifier between the plus and minus outputs. And this one is an inverter taking the, the output of the difference amplifier. And then you have the positive and negative outputs going to XLR. But if you look at the PCB, we see that there are three op amps. These are dual op amps. So there are three op amp gates per output. And this one only has two. 
and they note here that a three open output state schematic is available if you talk to an FAE. So I suspect here they use this three open output state. I was doing some googling about it and, and found this DIY audio discussion and someone is suggesting here that this could be a similar output states as on the Pro DAC and it's shown here. Here they use one gate per output and then there's a third one that is a common mode buffer. So these all together basically works as a full differential amplifier. One thing they don't say anywhere in the datasheet is that the DAC chip has a voltage and current output modes and I presume it's automatically selected which one it uses based on the, the impedance of the output states. Here how these are connected because there are no resistors before the op amps. This is a current mode and that's the, where you get the best performance of the DAC chip. So most of these output stages are current mode. So the first stage converts the current to voltage and there is low pass filtering as well. And then this one basically just removes the common mode voltage because there is a DC offset at the outputs. When we look at the menu of the SMSL DAC, we also noticed that there was this DPLL setting and here it is also in a register you can select the bandwidth, but the datasheet doesn't mention it anywhere else, so there's no information what it actually means, what settings should you use in what kind of use cases. If you look at this circuit here, so this is an LDO and generating a voltage that I presume is buffered by this OPA1612 op amp and the two outputs are here and here so I suspect this wire is going to this one so they're going to the DAC pins 1 and 8 1 and 8 are the DAC reference voltages so that is what this does other than that I don't think there's a lot going on all the passives here are just capacitors or ferrite beads they use NP0 capacitors and some a little bit bigger resistors in these round cases. I don't know what are the trimmers for, it could be DC offset, but that's pretty much it. It seems to be working really, really well. That was quite a lot of information on the DAC. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. In the next video, we're going to be replacing the mains power supply with my own and also replace two internal voltage regulators, so please stay tuned.